I just would like to kind of take full and figure out, like, in your teaching, what ages you have and what your homes and telling us your name, that's fine, and then what grade you teach and when your time frame for teaching is. Okay, so I'm kind of weird right now. Okay. I'm not really teaching anything. I help a little bit in the children's church, which is a multiple of ages from four years to fourth grade, I think. But what I'm really thinking, the lens I'm looking at this through today is in Honduras, where we're missionaries. Yes. Um, and then we came to myself. Um, um, just culturally, it's super different there. And so a lot of times the kids, by the time they get to us in Sunday school, they really haven't had a lot of structured instruction before. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's all I'm saying about that. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Debbie. Um, North Point, in Sandusky. Okay. Um, and I teach Sunday school and also junior church. Okay. And anywhere from uh, age four all the way up to uh, 11. Okay, so you have a big gap. So, and yeah. are those always all together? So when you say, okay. Yeah, because okay. we, we don't have enough uh, volunteers. No, we understand. The yeah. Lord just recently blessed <laughs> so us to be able to break that out. So yes. yes. I'm, I'm Deb, and okay. I, I help out with Kathy. Okay. And, you know, and Libby kind of work together. Fantastic. She does the, the junior church bell, but uh, Sunday school. Uh, do you have to teach all the time both of those classes, or do you get a break? Okay. Yeah, I do have a help in junior church. Okay. Um, which they're going to start taking one, one Sunday a month. Good for you. Right. Mm -hmm. I was getting ready to advocate for you to find somebody who would be yeah. able to take one. Good. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, good. Sir? Uh, work to death. I'm really hoping you can throw on the managing and unmanaging senior citizens segment. <laughs> I'm not going to even touch that one. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm the family special pastor, so it varies from time to time. Right. This one? And I don't actually teach any children's ministry, but I work more with, just with teenagers, but I disciple and counsel a lot of young moms. And so that's kind of my thoughts for this because it's been a while since I've had young ones, so just to refresh a little bit. Yes. Hi, I'm Brian. Here at Crest Point, I'm currently involved in Awana. Okay. So we help out with cubbies, four okay. and five year olds. So it's a lot of fun. Is that still Wednesday nights? Yes. Okay, so after a day of school then. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, I'm Rebecca from Crest Point, and I teach four through six year olds. Sunday school? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm Katie from Crestman as well, and I um, have done the Children's Church program, and so that's like four years to third grade. Okay. All right. I'm Amy. I teach the nursery, which that has a great sense of humor. <laughs> I don't like babies. <laughs> so, but most of them aren't babies anymore. Yeah. Now. yeah, they're a little bit over yes, now. They are. So, but I did have Vivi the other day. Okay. So, and then on Wednesday nights, I teach our class the three to five year olds. I'm Amanda. I'm an unmanageable senior citizen. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why I was just going to touch that. Miss in here. <laughs> I am blessed, though, to teach six and seven year olds Sunday morning and Sunday school hour. Okay. All right. Fantastic. With 25 seconds to go, it's 11 o'clock. So that was spectacular. All right. Um, let's open in prayer and then I'll introduce myself and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this morning and for the opportunity to look into um, how we can be better teachers to help our students understand your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember um, the message of the gospel and the power that it has to change lives as we talk about um, possibly some unmanageable children or teenagers and some things that we can do to help in those situations. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So I'll introduce myself real quickly. My name is Rebecca. I'm married to Stephen, um, the main stage speaker this morning. Um, we've been married for uh, over 19 years in August, and we have four um, getting ready to turn or have already turned within a six week period. So 16, 13, 12, and nine. 
So um, we have um, almost 19 years of experience in ministry. We actually um, went to school in Florida and we met um, there. And then the Lord actually brought us to this church um, in 2000 and we were here for four years. Um, we've taught in all of, well, Stephen is mostly youth, young marrieds, and then adults. I've taught from nursery. I share a quarter sometimes with Miss Amy, and we teach nursery age. Um, and I've taught all the way through teenagers. Um, I have an education degree, and I guess that's about all you need to know about me. So um, let's get started. And I want us to, to keep this in mind, and that is this, that in our teaching time, every time we are with our kids, that communicating the gospel of Jesus to them is, our, is of utmost importance. It is the main thing we do. So whatever method we choose to do that, our message of the gospel should never change. And sometimes our methods will have to be varied because we might have children that we would consider unmanageable or challenging. So I want to look at the definition of unmanageable. I thought this was interesting. And the definition of unmanageable is this not manageable <laughs> so for a moment could we please pretend that that part of the definition is not actually in existence um and we're going to call it unmanageable and we're going to use the definition not easily restrained or governed or directed not easily wielded which i really like that definition um, a little bit about us and our family. We live on five acres. We have lots of um, potential for animals. We just finished sending our third steer to the butcher, so we have just chickens right now. But um, the name of our property is Four Arrows Acres, and we chose that based on the Psalms passage about children being inherited from the Lord and as arrows are in the hand of an archer. For us, that was just an exceptional verse to communicate what we want for our boys. We want them to be straight and well-fletched, those are the feathers on the back, so that their mission and their point is always, or their target is always right there, ready to go. We want them to be able to be wielded. A professional archer can wield a bow and an arrow so that he hits his target every time. And so looking possibly at your children in your classrooms or your teenagers as um, arrows that God has given you the privilege to have time to maybe whittle off some edges and straighten up some fletches. So maybe this morning you could look at your unmanageables as a bent arrow or a sword that has some mix out of it and needs some work so that it can be used to its best ability. But I want us to think that every child or teenager, and I may use the word child more regularly because that's usually where I am, but please know that applies to whoever you have. Um, is there's a sweet spot for all of them. There really is. Somewhere they learn best, and somewhere they are manageable. We just have to figure out where that somewhere is located. What is it for them that makes them motivated to participate, engage, listen, what you might call obey, follow the rules, stay in the boundaries, so this morning, I want us to look at looking at the definition of not easily wielded, okay? Um, I, we're going to work on the assumption that we can find that spot for each child. And I want us to think about the part that says not easily, because I know you guys are aware that preparation time is not an easy thing. And teaching is not an easy thing. But when you have kids in your class, who just won't come in with everybody else, then teaching becomes exceptionally difficult sometimes. Um, it's difficult for you as the teacher. It is difficult for that child who at that moment to you seems quite impossible. And then it's, different for, or it's difficult for all the other kids. It's not easy for them either. So I want us to focus on a couple of things this morning that we talk about unmanageability. Some causes for unmanageability, and then we want to look at um, some preventative measures for unmanageability. And then at the very end, if perchance your child maintains their unmanageability, how are we supposed to handle them when they just stay in that defiant stage and you just can't get them to budge? 
So I'm going to rattle off three things very quickly that I think are probably our most common problems for unmanageable children, and that would be three lacks. We lack routines and rules. We lack knowledge of our students. What do they need? How do they learn? Who are they? And we lack preparation. And when I say preparation, that might be that that's just not your best preparation for that week. It could also simply mean that it's not the proper preparation once you know your child or once you know your students and you can gauge how to better prepare your lesson, and your thoughts for that day based on what you know about them. All right, so let's look at the first one, preventing unmanageability. So we're gonna stick with that very first routines and rules, okay? We did causes, so let's look at those causes and figure out how to prevent them. In preventing unmanageability, some rules and routines. First of all, please, if you have rules and things that you expect, put them on the wall. Make sure your kids are aware of the rules that you have for your classroom. The thing that I gave you this morning, let me grab one of these very quickly in color or in black and white, however you got it. Um, here, do you have one of these, Mr. Gosh? There you go. Yes. This is just something um, I found recently. I think it works exceptionally well. It's called Give Me Five. It keeps your kids moving. So please, again, if I say kids a lot, you know, you can use this. Focus it more toward teenagers. Grow it up a little bit. You know, change the colors or whatever you need to do. But Give Me Five. So giving you five, you can look at your paper, that, those five things are parts of their body that you are making clearly aware to them what should be occurring with your eyes, what should be occurring with your lips, your ears, your hands, um, your brain thinking about the speaker, probably looking at more at a fourth through sixth grade when you hit this. For a third grade and under, I would say put something on the bottom like legs crossed if you sit on the floor, or feet on the floor, eyes for, you know, facing forward in your desk if you have desks or chairs. Um, but post something in your room that helps your kids know exactly what you expect from them when their time for busyness or play is over and it's your turn to talk. Um, also, <clears throat> keep your rules like in number as few as possible. That's helpful. That way when you have to remind them and you're rattling off the rules, you're not taking 10 minutes to go down a poster of 25 things that you expect for your classroom. So do your best to keep them clear and concise and posted where they can see them. I would like to give you this piece of information. I found it yesterday when I was flipping through some things you might be interested in looking and pastor spoke to this, but there was a set of posters that you could print from Pinterest and they were things for like a youth room. And my favorite one was, um, was this, um, take what you're given and don't throw a fit. And that may seem trite to some of you, but in my experience over the last few years, I have learned that there are a lot of kids who don't like what they're given and they are very willing to tell you that they don't like what they're given. And so even um, you know in a youth room, I thought that was hilarious. But here was my thing was, if you have a poster full of rules I find that that's a spectacular way for us to help children understand why God gave us the Bible. Like, I didn't just make that rule up out of nowhere. God teaches me to be content. Let's take that rule, let's look it up, let's study on what it means to be content. How can I be content? I can be content by taking what I'm given and not throwing a fit. So just a little blurb there, there were some really good attitude helpers that I found. Um, but being able to tell your kids why these are on the wall based on scripture is really important, really important. Um, number two in your routines and rules, remember that your kids need them. Unmanageability might come because they don't have any rules and they don't have any routine and they are completely insecure about where their place is in that classroom. Um, kids need boundaries, they provide security. Please do your best to be consistent. That will help with unmanageability. I have one child in particular, every single week, he does the same exact thing with the crayon bucket. And after I finish my quarter next week, after 11 weeks, he still does the same thing with the crayon bucket. It's time to pick up crayons. Would you please put your crayons in the bucket? And then I pick three helpers. And what does he do when it's time to put his crayons in the bucket? 
The person walks by and he shoves his crayons down so that the child holding the bucket hits the floor and the crayons go everywhere. So every week, I just push the crayons to the side. I let the child who spilled the crayons go pick up the crayons and we continue with our lesson. The first couple of weeks, I politely helped him pick it up. I told him not to do it. After that, he continues to ignore me. We're gonna continue with what's happening. You're gonna have to pick up your crayons for nine weeks now, probably. Nothing unusual happens tomorrow. We will have done that. Be consistent. Be consistent. If you have a rule that tells them eyes on the speaker and their eyes are not on the speaker, let them know there might be a consequence for that and be consistent with that. Um, here's something really good I have found and that is when I say be consistent, variety is good, but I don't mean in your discipline or in your rules of the room. Kids like variety. And when I say variety, they might like for you to reorganize how you do snack, lesson, song, activity, craft, but they're still gonna expect all the parts and pieces of that lesson to be there every week, just not the same order. Um, be aware that some children do not function well out of order. So if they are accustomed to coming in, put your Bible sticker on the wall, put your Bible in your cubby, coloring page, song time, memory verse, lesson, and you switch it, that the next week they literally may have a meltdown. And that might look like a meltdown, or it might look like a complete rebellion to whatever you want to do that day. Well, I don't want to do that. Really what they're trying to tell you is, we've never done it in this order before, and I don't know how to handle that. So just be aware of that. We'll talk a little more about that in getting to know your students. Try to use some incentives and rewards to help with manageability. Um, you don't have to be fancy and you don't have to be expensive. Be age appropriate. Uh, Miss Rebecca has four to six year olds. I'm quite sure a sticker chart is fantastic for them, especially if they're allowed to put their own sticker on the chart. They just think that's great. So try to come up with an incentive and a reward that is age appropriate, that is relevant for them. Um, maybe a long-term reward system for training, such as if you're trying to get them to bring their Bible, put that one on the wall for a whole quarter. Let them put a sticker up every time. Um, be careful, depending on your age, that you don't necessarily demand 100%, because if you have a four-year-old, may not be ready to remember to get their Bible every week, so it's mom and dad's job. So you come to class and you're like, oh, you didn't bring your Bible this week? Well, it was your last week and you had them all there. I'm sorry just, that they literally will have a meltdown. And it could have just been that mom and dad weren't with it that morning and they didn't remember. Continue to encourage that. Do your best to be consistent, but remember your ages may depend on mom and dad and how much participation is helpful there. Um, something else that I have found that helps with manageability of children, especially ones who like to give you trouble, is to give them privileges to help. Now that may seem a little counteractive when I say they're being hard to manage, give them a privilege. So if you want to call it a responsibility, then that's fine as well. But letting them help is tremendous. I found that even teenagers who are requested to take on a job, and as, as dealing with teenagers, I would make it a job that they're responsible for every week and eventually they shouldn't have to be told to do it. You know, you come in, your job is to make sure the floor is swept and the chairs are straight and pens are ready to go. Uh, that's huge. Uh, that does help a lot with helping build in them some ownership, some responsibility, um, some factors that can play into oftentimes them being unmanageable because they just don't feel like they have a place. Um, so, rules and routines. Number two in preventing manageability would be to know your students. Know your students. Um, if you come into a classroom of four through six year olds or four through sixth graders, you're going to have a huge range, first of all, of ages. That's a big span. We have preschoolers to kids who are probably finished with kindergarten. That is a massive age range. For you ladies who teach four to 11, that is giant. That is a really hard age range. So. Um, let me give you some tips on learning your students, which will then better help you prepare a lesson to be geared toward them being manageable for lesson time. And that is, what kind of learner are they? I, I believe in your handouts, I gave you a, yes, lovely. On the back of your Give Me Five is a learning style questionnaire. <clears throat> 
If you would take that out, please. And oh, let me just get my time so I make sure I'm not going to run late. She said that we did that. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if we can get done with this, and you guys can figure out what kind of learner you are. Go ahead and take the quiz, please. One, two, and three would signify one never applies to me, two sometimes applies to me, and three often applies to me. And if you take this quiz, please, and then we'll go through and look at what kind of learner you are, but this will help you with your students. So you guys take it, and then we'll move forward. Good to go. You may need more time. Still adding numbers. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's take poll real quickly. If you are an auditory learner, raise your hand. Fantastic, which means none of you should come to class with less than at least two things in your hands because you guarantee you're gonna have children in your class who can't just sit it, look at you, and listen, and hear anything that you said. They're gonna look at you probably, they may listen to you, but what they take out of your classroom will be very little, very little. Um, and I guarantee you they're gonna be, what you think, unmanageable, because they need to be doing something, and you're just talking, and they, they're gonna be doing something. So, auditory learners, none of you were. How about visual learners? Okay, three of you, fantastic. So, things like videos, um, drawing on a board, that sort of thing, that works for them. Um, possibly paper that you would hand out, like I did for you guys to see this Give Me Five. Posters on the wall, that's super helpful for them. They are gonna need that for rules. Okay, how about kinesthetic learners? Wow. So, for Pastor Jim, what are you? Weird. Okay. That's right. There's a possibility for a combination. It says at the bottom. Yes. That they're all close to equal, but you probably will have a perverted and it's weird. Okay, fantastic. I don't think it says that, but okay. So, kinesthetic learners. All right, let's do a little bit of talking about that. An auditory learner, someone who learns by hearing. What I did for you today, I'm pretty much just giving you a lecture. There's really not a lot for you to look at, except for your give me five papers. I didn't bring anything for you to do, really, except for the notes that you're taking. Um, so that may not work very well for you guys, because not many of you are auditory learners. We'll have to see. Um, visual learners, they probably are going to need like a PowerPoint, um, that sort of thing. Kinesthetic learners, most. I'm, I'm learning, it's interesting that it seems most of the kids today are they're visual or kinesthetic learners. There are not too many auditory learners, there just aren't. A kinesthetic learner needs for you to turn your lesson into something that they can do. Um, the last two, three weeks we've done Moses, that's been our lesson, so in class, um, we had a basket where we all carried Moses and put him in the basket. We carried the basket and we put it in the river. It doesn't have to be anything complicated or high preparation, but they need to be doing. Last week we did Moses parts the Red Sea. So I made um, giant gallon Ziploc bags with hair gel and we put blue food coloring and glitter in it. So you zip the bag, tape it off really well, make sure all the air is out, flatten it out. And all the kids get a bag, and then they smash it out, and then they can push a path through the Red Sea. Then they can be the Israelites walking through the Red Sea. Then they can push the water back in on top of all the Egyptian soldiers as God pushed the water back on top of them. But that whole time of the lesson, they were playing with that. You may not think that they're hearing you, but almost every kid in class last week 
could tell me during review time exactly what happened. We camped by the shore, we split the water, we pushed, they all could do that because their hands had been moving to help with that lesson. You, you will probably have mostly visual and kinesthetic learners in your classroom, and your knowing that information should impact how you prepare your lesson, which will then impact whether or not you have a manageable child or an unmanageable child in your classroom. If you have a, kinesthetic, a classroom full of kinesthetic learners and all you do is come in and read them the Bible story, they are going to appear to be unmanageable to you because they're not just sitting and listening to you. They can't do that. God did not wire their brain that way. Now, don't hear me say that we cannot teach them to obey. For these two minutes, we are going to sit and listen to God's word about what he says about the Red Sea for two minutes. You may have to remind them in that two minutes, no, it's not where we're still not done. Don't, don't hear me say we cannot teach them obedience and learning to bring their body under subjection, which is something that scripture speaks to with the help of the Holy Spirit. Maybe your children are not saved yet, so don't expect them to have that Holy Spirit inside going, teacher said sit still you need to sit still that's probably not happening so for your kinesthetic learners for your visual learners that makes a difference in how you prepare your lesson and lesson preparation then should be geared toward them which means it may be harder to prepare a lesson because if you're not that kind of learner then you don't know what that means Pinterest Google, they're loaded with ideas that can help hands-on things for your kids. An unmanageable child is most typically not unmanageable. They just need somebody to get on their sweet spot with them and help them learn where they learn. Um, something else I want you to think about when knowing your students is this. Are they a boy or are they a girl? Let's be realistic. I happen to be biased toward boys. I have four of them. And then on Wednesday nights, I pick up three extra children, two of whom are girls, and I bring them to the house. We do school, homework, dinner, and then we go to Quest. And those two girls are becoming comfortable in my house now, and I'm learning what it's like to have a girl. And I don't really prefer it. So um, that, that is a huge difference in girls and boys. And let me share this video with you. If you would like to go watch this, I would highly encourage this. It's called War on Boys. It's a video, you can pull it up on YouTube by Prager U. It's called War on Boys. It is a video that helps us to understand the hostility toward boys that's happening in our society today and how we have structured our school environments and a lot of our public environments to lend themselves toward girls. Yeah. The feminism movement, there's a lot of yeah. things that plays into that. Yeah. But the video is called War on Boys, um, by, and it's by Prager U. Um, boys are not typically meant to sit in a chair and look at you and listen and sit in a chair and color a picture and sit in a chair and use a glue stick. That is not what boys are typically meant to do. They're just not. So when you're thinking preparation for my lesson, how can I work toward something for the girls where we're gonna be crafting or where we're gonna be making a snack or where whatever girls do. I don't know a lot about what girls do. Um, so whatever it is that they do, it's a more quiet, docile, most of the time environment. When you're preparing, please think of boys. They will not want to sit the whole time. If all you can do is have them push their chair up and have them stand up when they're coloring, that is fantastic for them. That makes a huge amount of difference. Um, but go watch that video, uh, War on Boys by Prager U. Um, God created boys and girls differently. We all, we all know that, we can say that, but I think as teachers, we often forget that and how it needs to be applied in our preparation and our teaching time. Um, so please make sure that one of the things you're looking at when you're saying, why won't this student listen? Well, maybe because you're teaching toward a boy's style and you have all girls. Or maybe you're teaching toward a girl's style and you've got half girls and half boys. 
So try to mix it, give it something for, give something for all of them to participate in. Um, it's, it's really important. Um, one of the things I'm learning with the kids that I have right now, um, we as teachers in the church environment today are doing a lot of parenting um, in teaching them things like, someone else is talking, it's not your turn, you need to sit down. Snack time is not a grazing fest. I think that's a pet peeve for me, but I struggle. The kids who take their snack and just walk around the room, I'm like, what are you doing? We sit down to eat our snack. And so, but I don't, you know, maybe that's okay at their house, but there are going to be places that these children are gonna to have to be one of these days, and they're going to be required to sit down and eat their food and listen to the person who is talking, and it will not be their turn to talk, or they'll be considered rude or asked to leave or whatever. And a lot of what we do in our classrooms is parenting. So please try to remember too that when you see unmanageable, it could be that what you consider common sense, like Stephen mentioned, is not common sense. It's common training. You were taught to do this. You taught your children to do this. But this family doesn't do it that way. And so it may be that you need to do a little bit of training. They're not unmanageable. They just don't know what they're supposed to be doing right now. Um, so. Third thing when you're looking at preventing unmanageability is a family situation. I'm not gonna talk a long time about this, but I think this one might be one that would be in the common sense venue of, what's their home life like? You know, do we have both mom and dad? Do we have two moms and they're visiting? Do we have two dads and they're visiting? Do we have a single parent at home? Are we being raised by the grandparents? All of those options. What about, are we moving? Is there a new job for one of the parents? Um, is there a sibling, an older sibling who's struggling with something? Like all of these things can play into how you see um, behavior manifested in a child. Um, so be aware of the family situation. I know it is probably difficult also to get accurate information sometimes on a family situation based on the age of the children that you have. So whatever you feel like is the best venue for going about checking on them, finding out um, you know, what's going on, if you need to talk to the parent and say, hey, you know, I've noticed some things are a little off over the last few weeks. Is there something maybe I could pray about for you guys at home? That would be probably a huge open door for a parent who might just need to say, Ugh. So be aware that sometimes what you're seeing as unmanageability isn't necessarily unmanageability, it's just them dealing and coping with what's going on at home. Um, also, when you're looking for, I forgot to say this, I'm sorry, when you're looking for your learning styles and your kids, obviously you wouldn't want to give them, four to six girls, this massive questionnaire. I did look, there are some games on YouTube that you can go and research how to play some games with your kids and help determine the learning style of each of your kids. So that would kind of give you an idea of who you have in your class and how to do that. Um, uh, let's see, let me go back just for a second, make sure I cover that information. Yes, okay, we're good. So <clears throat> let's talk about when you're presenting your lesson, because this seems to be the time when unmanageability when unmanageability tends to pop its head up. Um, we talked about routines and things like that. Make sure you have a coming in routine for your kids because generally that's some sort of check-in um, and they really need something to do. Don't, don't be like, oh, hey, it's so good to have you. Put your name badge on. They walk into the classroom and then you're <laughs> looking at the door waiting on other kids to come and you got five kids back here tearing the room to pieces. So let me recommend that whatever that activity is that you're doing, make it something that points back towards your lesson. But keep them busy at all times. You guys know the phrase, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. And that is absolutely true. My boys, one of them a couple of weeks ago said when they were going up the stairs, mom, there's never any free time in this house. And I said, that's because the devil works in free time. And he kind of looked at me like, what? But it's true. So I gave a few examples of I had given jobs, they had some free time, what happened? An argument ensued, a Nerf war happened and things didn't get put back where they belonged. And then I was like, see, the devil works in the free time. So be careful when you have what you would consider free time, not lesson time. Make sure that you are commanding every single minute 
of that time for your kids. Have something to keep them busy. Um, also, when you're thinking about lesson preparation, um, make sure that your lesson flows. And by lesson, I, I think I mean, I should have said, make sure that your class time flows. From the minute they walk in the door, it should like flow like a blissful little creek running. There shouldn't be gaps. There shouldn't be, I don't know what's happening. There shouldn't be, let me race over and get some more things out of the cabinet. Do whatever it takes for you to be able to be completely and totally focused on them the entire time that their feet are in your classroom. Um, whatever you need to do to keep those little hands and those little mouths and those little minds busy toward the lesson and toward God's work for that day, then you do that. That will severely help in keeping little things from happening that you would consider challenging or unmanageable. A lot of times kids are just simply what we think of as unmanageable because they do not have a job. They do not have something they've been assigned to do, and so they're gonna find something to do. And generally, it's not gonna be what you would choose for them to do. So let's, let's bump down to, if you do have a child who is just feet planted on the ground, I'm not moving, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I have to be honest, I have not had a lot of kids like this, so when Stephen's like, need you to teach on managing unmanageables. I'm like, well, I can prevent some unmanageability, but I don't really know what to do with them when they're like steadfast and just die hard. I'm not doing what you ask me to do. Um, but I, I do have a couple of things that I was thinking through, and I'm going to give you some C's real quickly. Covert communication. Covert communication. Um, you all, if you're mothers, you probably have a mom look. Um, my boys tell me all the time, um, I don't think you ever got a mom look, you just kept your teacher look from school. Apparently that's different and it's apparently more mean looking, I don't know. So um, covert communication would be first of all, um, make sure you know what your look is that communicates. Why are you talking in the middle of class? Like, you know, like shoot them the look. Most kids know what that means. Most mm -hmm. children can immediately pick up on the fact that Miss Rebecca just got quiet for a minute, her eyes are staring me down, and I probably should stop what I'm doing. Notice I said most. <laughs> most kids can do that. My second go-to is to continue teaching, but to use their name in the middle of the sentence. So for instance, if I'm saying, boys and girls, today we are talking about Moses, we camped at the seashore, and then God said, maverick, please pay attention, and then we just keep going. Um, you don't have to stop your story to address the child. A lot of times you just need to add their name into what God said, no, not really, but into what you're teaching, that's just enough to pull them back. They're probably out in La La Land somewhere. It will bring them back and you may not have to say anything else to them. Those are my favorites. Um, I do have a couple of kids who don't respond to that. So we have next, commanding communication. You've got covert communication. Most of your other kids aren't gonna pick up on the fact that you threw in somebody's name or that you shot a lookout. But commanding communication. Let's talk about this a little bit because I'm seeing some things in today's society and I have two minutes when you go leave. Today's society that drive me nuts. Here's one of them. Do not get down on that child's level and speak to them. If you want to tell a child to be quiet, this is not the way to do it. Because then you just bow to them and now you're on their level. So lovingly, because it can be done like that, you should stay standing up. You should speak to them directly. Katie, not that you're bad, but Katie, <laughs> Miss Rebecca has asked you to stop. It's time to be done. Put it down. Most of the time, most kids will respond to that. Um, I did learn a couple of things on some reading I was doing. First of all, declarative sentences in as few words as possible. It is time to put the crayons away. Not, it's time to put the crayons away, okay? No, because then you just gave the children an option to say, no, it's not okay. So, declarative sentences, as few words as possible. Also, don't get down on their level. Maintain your position. They need to be looking up 
to you. You're the authority figure. Teach them that. That can be done lovingly. It doesn't have to be hateful or anything like that. Um, also, um, do not explain your answer. Do not explain. It's time to put the crayons away. Because we're going to blah, blah, blah. No. Mm -mm. It's time to put the crayons away. What will most children immediately say? Either yes, ma'am, or why? In that moment, the only explanation you need to give is because I said so. And that is perfectly acceptable. Um, that is one of the things I'm seeing when we're talking about teaching and being parents in Sunday school is that it is perfectly acceptable for an authority figure to give an instruction and for the child to just do it because they were told. That is teaching them simple obedience. I have this written in my Bible. When Philip spoke to the eunuch, God said to Philip, go speak to the eunuch. Philip went and opened his mouth. Simple obedience. And we want kids to learn that because at some point in their life, hopefully they will have accepted the gospel and God will call them to do something. And we don't want them to stand around going, why? I need an explanation. What about? No, just simple obedience. Yeah. So when you give your declarative sentences, don't give an explanation. And if they ask why, your answer should simply just be because I said so. If you have a kid who's still not budging, that's the time that I would say you need to move them outside the classroom. Hopefully you have another helper and you just need to give them options. They have a choice to make then. This is choice communication. Your choice is this. You can go inside and obey, or we will go find your parents or your grandparents and you may sit with them for the rest of the service or the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, I would do your best to drop the child off with the grandparent or parent and not disrupt that adult as much as possible. Walk them to the room, leave them there, and then either find them immediately after service so you can communicate what happened, all of the process steps that were taken to provide as much opportunity for the child to come into the boundaries and, or if you can't catch them at the church, give them a phone call. But don't leave that unattended, but you also don't want to interrupt the adult in their class as much as possible. Um, those would be my big ones for if you've got your child with the heels dug in the ground. Give your covert communication of a, you know, a quick name in the middle of a sentence, look at them, communicate clearly with them with your declarative sentence, no explanation, because I said so, if they're still holding their ground, then they're deter they're distracting from the other children learning, which can be explained to them when you step outside the door. Now this just isn't about you, but your sin is affecting other people, which is something else we have to teach them. It's not just about what I want and I got my way and so I'm gonna choose sin. No, your sin is affecting all of your friends who are now unable to listen. And then you need to address that situation with their parent or guardian or whatever, so. Any questions? Okay, fantastic. I am three minutes over. I'm so sorry. Sorry, guys. I know, right? <sighs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be around the rest of the day. So we can chat or whatever. They actually went really fast. I know, which is my so. <laughs> so. Help yourself to your next location, which, if I'm correct, lunch. is lunch. lunch. Lunch? I didn't know we got lunch. I just thought we were going to be hungry till two. <laughs> Sweet! <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> I would have let us out earlier if I'd known lunch was best. You guys could have been there first. <laughs> oh, <geez. sighs> Okay. Thank you guys. I know. I just.